thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming out on a weekend morning, and thanks very much uh, for the invitation for this very interesting conference. Um, amnesty is a political measure, generally a legislative act or an executive order, much more rarely a plebiscitary or referendum order, that shields a designated person or set of persons from prosecution for alleged acts that would otherwise warrant it. At the core of the concept of amnesty, therefore, is the claim that the normal functioning of, of a municipal legal system can, under suitable circumstances, be significantly altered, indeed suspended, by extra judiciary bodies in order to bring about a politically desirable effect. The range of variability of amnesties, both ancient, uh, modern, and contemporary, is extremely broad, and much literature has been devoted to taxonomizing and evaluating this range of amnesty laws, acts, and provisions according to multiple criteria, including institutional design, scope and limitations, exclusions, associated accountability mechanisms, criteria for eligibility, assessment of short and long-term effects, and so on and so on. Working through even a brief uh, part of that taxonomy and that literature was well beyond the, the time that I have. So for the present, in the first half of this talk, I'll note the forms of amnesties most pertinent for contemporary international politics and international law, and call attention to some ways that we can avoid basic but surprisingly widespread misunderstandings of the concept of amnesty and its larger legal and political significance. In the talk's second half, already at start, I, this, is a recurring, this is a recurring dream I have most Augusts, that the first one leaves and then another, then another. And then another. <laughs> Normally it happens in August, but now it happens in March, I guess. <laughs> At least I'm wearing trousers, so there's that. Um, in the talk's second half, I'll then draw your attention to some of the features of contemporary amnesty Little debates. De Move the contemporary mic. amnesty debates that make them so normatively powerful and normatively difficult to assess. As I've said, amnesties are political acts uh, intended to suspend prosecution or or Okay? All right. Uh, it bears emphasis, uh, oh. Amnesty, as I've said, is a political act that suspends prosecution or other legal attention for designated persons in pursuit of political ends. It bears emphasis th that this is a suspension of criminal prosecution in the primary sense, and so only derivatively a suspension of sanctions, punishments connected to a successful conviction. I emphasize this fact due to the widespread misconception that amnesties are roughly comparable to acts of executive pardon or clemency. In fact, they are deeply distinct. Um, waiving punishment consequent to a procedurally correct conviction is, for reasons I'll mention presently, vastly different from su suspending a trial, and thus any determination of legal guilt or innocence whatsoever. This facet of amnesties becomes prominent when the amnesty offenses are international crimes above all. The political ends that amnesties generally, and amnesties for international crimes specifically, are generally seen as promoting, are usually taken as uh, the increasing of prospects for peace in post-conflict or transitional contexts. In the standard case of amnesty, a government enacts legislation that shields current or former combatants for prosec from prosecution for their acts in the lead up or during the conduct of armed uh, conflict as a way of incentivizing cooperation including the end of violence, de-arming and demobilization, commitments to refrain from further extra-legal political opposition, or reintegration into a settled political process. In this core sense, amnesties have been something of a classic feature in the politics and jurisprudence of peace negotiations for both international and domestic armed conflict. Indeed, the only specific use of amnesties um, uh, uh, of the term amnesty in the language of the most significant international treaties occurs in the 1977 Protocol 2 to the Geneva Conventions, which governs the protection of victims in non-international conflicts and provides, quote, at the end of hostilities, the authorities in power shall endeavor to grant the broadest possible amnesty to persons who have participated in the armed conflict or those deprived of their liberty for reasons related to the armed conflict, whether they are interned or detained, end quote. But that generally positive sense of amnesties clearly runs into significant difficulties when, as I've indicated, the paradigm case for post-conflict amnesties deals with whether it is legally and morally permissible to waive prosecution for international crimes uh, rather than mere participation in a domestic or international armed conflict. As political initiatives by executives or legislatures to seek peace by waiving prosecution, even amnesties for the worst offenses can potentially appear not only practically or pragmatically advisable, 
but one might argue, and many have, in some circumstances even morally obligatory. Amnesty can rightly be seen as a very powerful and uh, low-cost part of the toolkit for fragile democracies as they negotiate with potential democratic spoilers, for whom the guarantee of legal immunity for their acts can be a powerful incentive for nonviolence and cooperation, or even integration into democratic politics post-conflict. Inefficient and corrupt domestic criminal legal systems, which are often the case in post-conflict contexts, offer bleak prospects for the administration of criminal justice, and so offers of amnesty may also amount to little more than acknowledgement of reality on the ground. Um, on both principle and pragmatic grounds, then, political authorities may well conclude that the pressing demand for securing shorter-term goals of physical security uh, and countering the threat of democratic spoilers uh, w might decisively override uh, the more abstract value of criminal justice in any case. So for these reasons and more, amnesties have uh, remained perennially attractive for transitional states. And the virtual absence in both treaty and customary international law of explicit bars on their use reflects states' extreme reluctance to renounce them. Finally, amnesty clearly has at least some connection, however indirect, with extra-legal values of forgiveness which authorities may well have good reason to pursue by means of, of domestic politics. Okay, so that's on the plus side. On the other <laughs> hand, <coughs> yeah, the history of, it's dialectics in action, right? Uh, on the, in contrast, the history of national amnesty laws and policies in the context of post-conflict justice uh, also gives ample reason uh, to complicate this generally positive or at least permissive view of the nature and function of amnesties, and above all, amnesties for the most serious uh, uh, crimes, of uh, international crimes. The notorious blanket and self-amnesties of outgoing authoritarian regimes in the Southern Cone during the 1970s provided a graphic illustration of just how morally repugnant executive self-amnesties could be, uh, and the strong negative reaction of the international community to the manifest injustice that such blanket amnesties created was a signal contributing moment in the rise of international legal institutions that promised an end to impunity uh, for political leadership guilty of, se of serious human rights violations. The famous Amnesty Committee uh, in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission was explicitly designed to counter virtually all of these egregious, egregious features of these uh, blanket and self-amnesties. The committee's design called for amnesties to be individualized and made conditional on a number of strong demands, including an exhaustive application process, compulsory testimony, and the documentation of the political nature of the offenses for which the amnesty was requested. And while the South African experiment remains unique in many ways, um, it established a strong normative expectation in international relations and international law that domestic amnesties for international crimes could not count as meeting a state's international legal obligations unless the amnesty policy fulfilled basic conditions designed to assure some level of individual accountability. Taken as a whole, these many conditions were intended to prohibit amnesty policies from serving merely as de facto admissions of the impunity of perpetrators for, for uh, grave, widespread uh, violations of, of human rights. But the legacy of the South African experience from the middle of the 1990s has been conflicted, to say the least. Transitional justice theory and practice remains deeply skeptical of domestic amnesties, rightly observing that they are prima facie uh, failures of justice, that their institutional design and implementation is notoriously open to inefficiency and abuse, and that the longer-term contributions of amnesty policies to conditions of stability for the right reasons are cloudy at best. On the international level, the rise of international criminal law and its corresponding institutions during the roughly past 20 years culminated with the birth of the International Criminal Court in 2002. Uh, whatever else we may make of this remarkable rise of the profile of international criminal law, it's certainly clear that much of its justification is the pursuit of an international anti-impunity norm. The idea that fighting impunity for perpetrators of serious international crimes is so important that in extraordinary measures and uh, great resources are justifiable uh, in its pursuit. This international anti-impunity norm and its institutionalizations um, are both clearly difficult to square with the practice of domestic amnesties in cases where those who receive amnesty are shielded from prosecution for acts that would rise to meet the definition of international crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crimes of aggression, and genocide. Um, and it's not hard to see in international relations and jurisprudence over the last decade a stubborn though often overshadowed conflict over the normative status of domestic amnesties and the meaning and value of the anti-impunity norm. An international, although arguably 
primarily European, normative consensus has definitively emerged among a broad spectrum of legal and international relations scholars and international NGOs regarding the impermissibility of domestic amnesties for the most serious international crimes. This consensus is an entailment, obviously, of the anti-impunity norm. Domestic amnesties for international crimes, according to this consensus view, are in principle incompatible with states' treaty-based and customary international legal obligations. The persons benefiting from such amnesties should not expect any extraterritorial effect of their prosecution of their protections and immunities, and the international community has a standing legal obligation to take over the investigation, prosecution, and punishment of such persons in cases where the relevant state is unwilling to do so. Given the statute's provisions for the, inter, uh, for the United Nations Security Council to make referrals to the court's office of the prosecutor for cases involving nationals, even of non-member states to the Rome uh, statute, this means that the international court has at least in principle potential jurisdiction for prosecution of anyone, anywhere, whose acts give, may uh, give reason to believe that international crimes have been committed. Notwithstanding this consensus, however, the, uh, the status, meaning, and normative evaluation of domestic amnesties remains anything but clear, and we are in a, a, a state right now of, of remarkable lack of clarity on the meaning and extent of, of domestic amnesties. Um, most people in the world um, are, after all, citizens of countries that are, not state party, that, that are not state parties to the Rome Statute, and the court's first decade of prosecutions hardly inspires uh, enthusiasm. Regarding amnesty, the term is, of course, entirely absent from the language of the Rome Statute. The courts, um, um, uh, 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 on the insistence of multiple countries, um, that the statute remains silent or at least extremely quiet on the international legal status of such amnesties. Moreover, the near total silence of international treaty law on the legality of domestic amnesties is hardly offset by current developments of customary uh, international law. A number of very prominent legal theorists and human rights advocates have argued in the last five years that customary international law can be seen as currently in the process of crystallizing, uh, that's the term of choice, a customary norm to the effect that domestic amnesties for international crimes uh, are contrary to states' international legal obligations. While the argument for such a crystallization process is not without weight, the doctrine of legal custom is quite clear in requiring recognition of a new customary norm to rely on established state practice opinio juris, that is, a crystallizing international legal norm must document that a majority of states are already acting on the basis that it is a norm, and they must be doing so by virtue of taking it as a binding legal norm on them. On this standard test of legal custom, the argument for a crystallizing anti-amnesty norm encounters a fatal problem. For according to the most complete and up-to-date data sets available, the frequency of domestic amnesty policies uh, in post-conflict and transitional contexts has in fact increased, rather than decreased, uh, over the course of the uh, anti-impunity norm uh, from the 19, middle of the 1990s to as, as recently as the data goes, roughly around 2010. And while it's true that these policies often include standard accountability mechanisms, including carve-outs for some classes of international crimes, the steady increase in popularity of domestic amnesty policies is an important finding and one that needs explaining. Explanations are not hard to find. Uh, and in the contemporary literature and in international relations, they focus on the pragmatic considerations that make amnesty so attractive a relatively low cost, high return tool in any fragile state's domestic political toolkit, especially in contrast to the relatively low and overall abstract costs that might be paid in terms of international condemnation or even the remote chance of the assertion of universal jurisdiction. Amnesty's attraction in the context of the international anti-impunity norm therefore needs an explanation that goes beyond the standard uh, uh, pragmatic calculation of cost and benefit. The rational calculation of states and their reasons, of course, underlies to some important extent the ongoing debates about state sovereignty and its limits. But clearly, the transformed international legal landscape has granted amnesties a new, impotent, expressive dimension. So here's the thesis sentence. Um, it's <coughs> just in red. Uh, it's this expressive dimension and its content that will occupy the remainder of this talk. I will try to present the dimensions of sovereignty that amnesty policies evoke and express in ways that go beyond the standard pragmatic calculations of reasons of state. This expressive power, I suggest, must be understood if we are to see why domestic amnesties have maintained their attraction in the current international climate. All right. Part two, I hope it's shorter than part one. 
In 1949, Carl Schmitt published a short essay uh, titled uh, Amnesty oder die, die Kraft des Vergessens, Amnesty or the Power of Forgetting. In it, Schmitt argued that the seamless transition from the end of uh, the Second World War to what he called the new uh, go, uh, global civil cold war um, was, uh, was uh, rapidly transmogrifying into a global war without measure, a war whose internal telos was not victory but annihilation. You all know about this. Uh, as with all civil wars, Schmidt claimed, the only alternative to mutual annihilation in global civil war was, for him, a mutual amnesty. And here's a quote from Schmidt. Amnesty means more than a mere pardon for minor offenses. It must be more than a mere act of sympathy we cannot refuse to one who has been tortured or persecuted for years. Amnesty is more than the cigarette offered to the condemned as a way of documenting one's own humanity. The cold civil war won't be ended that cheaply. Amnesty is more than a momentary relief from the persecutory apparatus of the state. It is a reciprocal act of forgetting. It is neither pardon nor charity. Whoever gives amnesty must also receive it. Let us at the very least preserve in its purity this remnant of divine law so that the only means for ending this cold civil war in a humane way is not itself forgotten." End of this quote. Now, in an initial sense, Schmidt is still, of course, uh, offering a sort of a straightforwardly consequentialist claim here. Uh, the old European-based spatial and legal order, the old nomos of the West, is gone and is not coming back. The emergent bipolar world order has consolidated this fading of the relative stability of the order of, of, the Europe, of, the order of um, European public law uh, and the principle of sovereign equality that supported it. Western states could no longer afford, either materially or spiritually, to de dedicate a massive legal apparatus toward the ends of retribution even as they struggle to mask this retributive will under the guise of moral and legal universal human rights discourse. Retribution as morality maintains within itself the link with the memory of pain that Nietzsche had already diagnosed. The will to exact retribution is the will to burn into memory the pain of injury and the wrong unless checked. This will become, will is capable paradoxically of suspending rather than preserving historical time and historical memory so that law in channeling and structuring the retributive will generates what Michael Ignatieff, writing in the context of the collapse of the former Yugoslavia, uh, refer calls the dream time of vengeance, in which the span of time between the event of harm and the moment of retributive justice has no actual magnitude. Schmidt thus evokes the archaic connection between amnesty and forgetting, and notes that forgetting, in its negative, um, uh, Rebecca's paper made this point yesterday, actually in a rather uh, fascinating way, uh, and notes that forgetting, where am I? in its negation of the will to retribution, has, in its turn, an archaic connection to peace, to tranquility, um, which Adorno would write about in terms of the, the myth of the lotus eaters, by the way. Um, amnesty, as Schmidt reminds us, must under no circumstances be confused with pardon. The latter, the traditional prerogative of the sovereign, waives punishment following legal judgment, whereas amnesty prevents the moment of judgment from ever happening at all. It is an act of sovereign political will that intervenes in the temporality that serially, serially orders act, judgment, and retribution in relationship to one another. In a, strict legal, in a strictly legal sense, this is the ontology behind the principle of the um, presumption of innocence. In a strictly legal sense, acts only become crimes at the moment of legal judgment. The judgment, therefore, does not, or does not entirely determine that a given act is rightly subsumed under a general legal standard. In so judging, the legal judgment creates the act as crime. Amnesties do not destroy the act nor the harm of the act, but they do annihilate, perhaps better cancel that forlorn attempt to translate Hegel, the judgment, and therefore cancel the act as crime. Not as act, but as crime. This, I think, is what Schmidt must have had in mind, in part at least, by describing the mutual act of amnesty as, quote, a remnant of divine law. The sovereign power to suspend the normal operation of criminal law, oh, the sovereign power to suspend the normal work of legal judgment is the power not just to suspend the operation of criminal law, but in doing so also to command a specific kind of forgetting, to summon and decree that acts as crimes are officially unmemorable and on that basis to decree that no enmity on the basis of those acts as crimes is legally permissible. 
this mutual act of sovereign uh, for, uh, forgetting was already well established, obviously, as a staple in the treaty language of the classic age of international and civil warfare, as Rebecca minded, reminded us yesterday, uh, where preamble language to peace treaties predictably required that amnesty and, and oblivion be established as a first necessary, if insufficient, condition for the very possibility of the enforcement of the terms of the peace uh, in the treaty itself. Writing al almost exactly 300 years after the ratification of the Peace of Westphalia, Schmidt in 1949 knew that the document certainly based itself on this formula of amnesty and oblivion, no less than the treaty ending the English Civil War in that very same decade. That formula of amnesty and oblivion, of non-prosecution as the sovereign will to make judgment and therefore crime not happen according to a future anterior negative subjunctive, it shall not have been, seemed to Schmidt the only possible remedy for a global civil war in which no bounds of forgetting and no end of retribution would be possible. Of course, in appealing to this archaic formulation, Schmidt also reassert, reasserts the connection between sovereignty and the power to command forgetting. Uh, for all of its obvious pragmatic value, this power does not merely reflect but performs what is perhaps the strangest and the most dramatic of sovereign powers, the, the power to suspend the normal operation of social or what we might even call moral time, offense, memory, vengeance, suffering. No wonder so many transitional and fragile governments find it so enthralling and find the international community's eagerness to strip them of this power uh, so objectionable. But the reaction of moral repugnance to this kind of sovereign power forgetting, conversely, also has to be taken seriously. Um, and this is actually, no surprise, the side I I'm, myself am on. Um, that repugnance, too, has a force and origin far more powerful than any consequentialist or pragmatic argument is able to capture. In 1959, almost exactly 10 years after Schmidt's plea for the power of forgetting, Adorno offered something like a progress report on the, on the work of national forgetting, uh, in his essay on the meaning of working through the past. Describing the moral principle that powered the post-war drive toward normalcy, toward psychic good health, and hence toward forgetting as a regimen of political hygiene, Adorno referred to the line from Goethe, a promise the devil makes to Faust, and that reveals, Adorno says, Satan's, uh, as he puts it, innermost principle. It's as good as if it never happened. That principle is the destruction of memory, and for Adorno, it encapsulates a specific kind of moral evil. What Adorno is excoriating here uh, is the project of forgetting that West Germany had in fact initiated and was observing that this work of collective amnesia, for all of its psychoanalytic trappings, also had a moral and specifically a deontic kernel. Where the dream time of vengeance was a relapse from morality into myth, the forgetting of suffering as a national program was a negation of morality into the profoundly immoral, what Adorno was prepared to call evil. The official policy of, forget, of the forgetting of suffering, loudly defended on any number of consequentialist grounds in the decades separating Schmidt's quote from Adorno's, had been all too successful, even in the absence of the kind of amnesty policies that Schmidt had been advocating for at the end of the Second World War. This success had, in effect, ushered a new kind of moral evil into the world, or maybe a very old kind of moral evil. Amnesty and oblivion, the standard formula for closing the books on a traditional armed conflict, could not conceivably be adapted to function as a mutual, symmetrical, sovereign act to close a genocidal war, especially in the absence of one of the sides whose amnesty would be um, required because they no longer existed. Okay, conclusion. <laughs> yeah. What else can you do? Uh, of course, I'm not suggesting that the contemporary domestic amnesties with in inadequate carve-outs for most serious international crimes replicate the kind of undiluted moral evil Adorno associated with sovereign acts of forgetting. I, but I do think that the strongly deontic character of most cosmopolitan legal arguments against domestic amnesties for international crimes as a core component of the global anti-impunity norm is hard to interpret or appreciate unless we bear in mind the kind of moral offense that Adorno had diagnosed in the 1950s in the spectacle of even a semi-official uh, national policy of collective oblivion. Of course, there are perfectly coherent consequentialist reasons for widespread efforts to end impunity. Um, in other words, they're not exclusively deontic reasons. Uh, and therefore, indirectly, to oppose domestic amnesty for national crimes. Even a deeply, imperfectly, in, deeply imperfect enforcement of international legal standards should have some deterrent effect. But this argument is, I think, desultory. The real push behind the anti-impunity norm has always been a deontic one, I think. 
In fact, it is a strongly desert-based and, and a hard retributivist argument regarding the overriding duty that states, um, um, that states assume, and in their unwillingness or incapacity, the international community will assume, to prosecute and punish perpetrators whose crimes are of a kind and scale as to be of direct concern to humanity as such. The idea of amnesty's effect is making such acts less shocking, perhaps even immemorable, is on, this, uh, on these grounds repugnant. And it offends in ways that help explain the effort and resources that have been poured with such variable success into the project of international criminal law over the last two decades. This effort is at heart, again, I would say, a non-consequentialist one. Advocates for a cosmopolitan version of international law and, and relations continue to draw inspiration and motivation from that and related visions of the foundational moral harm perceptible in such policies, however else they may recommend themselves on pragmatic grounds. Conversely, as I've said, the growing attraction of domestic amnesties cannot be entirely explained by reference to these pragmatic grounds alone. Amnesty evokes the pull of a vision of state sovereignty distinct in its claimed capacity to control politic, political, and social processes. Many, if not most, contemporary amnesty measures attach various accountability mechanisms, mindful of the moral revulsion that the specter of official acts of forgetting are bound to provoke and affected to some, one degree or another by uh, uh, the justice cascade of new international legal norms regarding the importance of combating Im impunity. Many of these uh, conditional mechanisms are directed consciously against the conflation of amnesty and forgetting, including linking amnesties with things like compulsory testimony that will become part of an official historical record of harms and offenses. But you don't need to read that much Halvox uh, with his opposition of history and memory to suspect that there is no obvious positive correlation between the commission of official histories of offenses and the survival in one way or another of the memory of the offense as a source of collective moral reflection. Thank you. Thank you. This is an important moment for me, uh, although as you will see, there is nothing field specific about the notion of, infra <coughs> of infrapolitics. Uh, and we use it in a sense uh, different from James C. Scott's version, by the way. Uh, infrapolitics develops as a project for thought within the field of Latin American studies. And this moment now <laughs> marks probably the first time it is presented and discussed outside the field. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity and for the invitation and look very much forward to seeing your, your, your reception and your critiques. Uh, but please bear with me, I only have 25 minutes and there, and there is a lot more that could be said than, than I can say within the time uh, allowed. Mm -hmm. There are several connections also with several papers and discussions from yesterday. I hope they will be noticeable uh, and perhaps we can discuss them later. I also want to mention infrapolitics has been taken up by a collective. Mm -hmm. We call it the Infrapolitical Deconstruction Collective. Pull, pull the mic a little closer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, a collective of about 35 members. Mm -hmm. I do not mean to speak for the group, mm -hmm. and I take full personal responsibility for what I am about to say. So what is infrapolitics? Or better put, less ambiguously, what does one talk about when one says infrapolitics? But even so, it's talking about something or other what one attempts through infrapolitics. Or is it rather a matter of speaking from a place or a site we would rather not thematize in order not to turn it into an object of research, which would imply the sort of structuration of things, the sort of image of the world that we are trying to pull ourselves out of in the first place. If language can hardly speak representationally about language without turning language into a representation, then infrapolitical language refuses, if it can, to turn infrapolitics into yet another mechanism for representation, another brand of thought in the marketplace of ideas, another political option in the university, for instance, another flavor of academic discourse. We're not interested in thematizing infrapolitics, thematizing infrapolitics, in turning it into another form of computation of the world. So what is our interest? In his 1983 letter to a Japanese friend, Jacques Derrida responds to a demand to offer, I quote, a schematic and preliminary reflection on the word deconstruction. 
and Derrida says, what deconstruction is not? Everything, of course. What is deconstruction? Nothing, of course. <laughs> we could perhaps say the same thing of infrapolitics, hmm? and nothing that is also at the same time not everything, but that might be hardly satisfying. In any case, like deconstruction, infrapolitics may turn out to be not a good word, simply something that one can only use more or less casually, not systematically, seeking specific effects in highly determined sit situations and so forth. That being so, there is more in the Derridian text about the bad word deconstruction that we can use casually and, and systematically for infrapolitics. Without attempting in any way, at any rate, not yet, not for a time, to indicate that deconstruction and infrapolitics may come down to the same thing, may be the same thing. The Rida complains about the sheer difficulty of fighting off the truism that deconstruction was negative, mostly negative, negative for the most part. True, there were some ostensible reasons for that, as people simply could not figure out what it was that deconstruction aimed to offer, positively speaking. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Rida says, deconstruction could not propose itself as an analysis since the dismantling of a structure is not a regression towards a simple element, towards an indissociable, an indissoluble origin. And the construction could not propose itself as a critique, since the instance of crinaying, of crisis, this decision, choice, judgment, discernment, is itself, as is all the apparatus of transcendental critique, one of the essential themes or objects of deconstruction. And the reader says the same thing can be said about method, which has the pleasant and unpleasant corollary that deconstruction, therefore, is not a methodology for reading and interpretation and can therefore not be reappropriated and domesticated by academic institutions. Finally, but not really, not really finally, <laughs> the Rida says that deconstruction is also not an act or an operation because there is something more passive about it than the passivity that is customarily opposed to activity and also because deconstruction does not return to an individual or collective subject. The most that can be said, therefore, for deconstruction is that it happens, there is deconstruction, ça se deconstruit, and the se bears the whole enigma, the Rida says. Well, there is a case to be made that infrapolitics, as we think of it, or as we let it think as, is neither an analytic tool nor a form of critique, neither a method, not an act or an operation, that infrapolitics happens, indeed, always and everywhere, and it's happening beckons to us and seems to call for a transformation of the gaze for some kind of passage to some strange and unthematizable otherwise of politics, which is also, it must be, an otherwise than politics. In the brief letter, letter to a Japanese friend, there is a hint of this strangeness which infrapolitics and deconstruction would share, hmm? which, which comes when the Rida, quite unexpectedly, I think, for most readers, says abruptly and without elaboration that deconstruction is therefore, hmm? and this seems to be a definition or the beginning of a definition, I quote, a discourse or rather a writing that can make up for the incapacity of the word to be equal to a thought. And thought is in quotation marks. Infrapolitics is also a region or a site, as we called it before, where some incapacity of the word to be equal to thought, to a thought, an unfillable gap or a fissure between language and thought happens. But infrapolitics cannot even claim the status of a discourse or rather a writing. Hmm? Infrapolitical reflection is of course both a discourse and a writing, but not infrapolitics as such, hmm? if there is or could be an as such of infrapolitics. So again, what is the interest of infrapolitics? Can infrapolitics make up for an incapacity, a lack, a gap between language and thought? Infrapolitics is minimally a field of reflection open to the exploration of conditions of existence at the time of the accomplishment of the structuration of political modernity. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want the ontotheological the structuration of modernity, or if you want, the architectonic, the, the conceptual architectonics of political modernity, to use Carlo Galli's uh, formulation. At such a time, that is now, 
We understand that experience, everyone's experience, is crossed by politics indeed, that politics marks and determines and frames experience in irreducible and fundamental forms. But we also understand, or think we understand, or would like to understand, that politics cannot exhaust, does not exhaust experience. Experience exceeds or subsides politics, and it can therefore be thematized and studied infrapolitically. Politics cannot be merely understood as a taken for granted natural event or procedure. I think we have a tendency to do that. Politics is itself subject to, a, to historical conditions of manifestation quite apart from obvious intrahistorical divisions such as left, right, liberals, conservatives, populist, technocrats, etc. Politics in its present range of manifestation, which is historical through and through, mm, still responds to a particular epoch mm, and to a particular structure of civilization. In other words, the nature of politics is not itself political, rather historical through and through. There is no intemporal politics, rather politics happens once every time even if it is a matter of a program being implemented, but the manner of its happening is not independent from a basic social ideology that frames the range of its occurrence. At the time of the self-accomplishment of ontotheology, at the time of the self-accomplishment of modernity, politics is ontotheological through and through, <coughs> even when it finds itself playing a so-called counter-hegemonic or resistant role and the fact that such determination may have been forgotten by us is no obstacle. It simply feathers its ideological nature. But infrapolitics does not seek to determine the nature of politics, not even in its contemporary late modernity dispensations. Infrapolitics, in other words, is not a critique of politics. Its interest, and we can call it a hermeneutic, phenomenological, or deconstructive interest, is to be found in the attempt to delimit the political determination in favor of its excess, mm? or if you want, in favor of its subsex, subsex, which is a neologism, you know, excess, subsex, connected to infra. Mm? At any rate, it's difference. Infrapolitics dwells in the difference from politics. Infrapolitics as a field of reflection or aside for reflection, reflects on the subs, subsex, how do you pronounce that? Subsess of politics. That is not politics as subsessed, rather the active infra excess of the political, whatever underflows politics as we know it. As an excess that precedes, as a site for reflection, not circumscribable or determinable by any political determination, which must remain blind to it, infra politics may indeed reach a critical dimension. Infra politics thinks of politics insofar as it thinks the otherwise than politics. But its primary exercise is not political critical, it is rather interpretive or hermeneutic. Infrapolitics lives and opens up in the withdrawal or the retrait of the political field, which means it does carry along an intense politicity, but it is the impolitical politicity that suspends and questions every apparent politicization, every instance of political emergence, every heliopolitical moment, if you want, and places them provisionally under the sign of a destruction. We have reserved a name for the impolitical politicality of infrapolitics. We call it post-hegemony, or even democratic post-hegemony. Infrapolitics meets in post-hegemonic democracy, or in its praxis, which is post-hegemonic democratization, the supplementary interruption of its own subsessive praxis. I will try to be clear on this, relatively clear. Mm. Infrapolitics is not a politics, but post-hegemonic democratization is a political praxis, and it would be hard to have one without the other. There can perhaps be infrapolitics without post-hegemony, but there is no praxis of post-hegemony without infrapolitical reflection. Both infrapolitics and post-hegemony attempt to think the gap between epochal politics, as it can be available to us, and its difference from itself, that in the human experience or in existence, that while marked or even covered over by politics, is itself not political, is not itself political, while it subtends politics. 
we may have forgotten about it, which makes bringing it back, bringing it back up more and not less urgent. How did this come about for us? If the project of the Infrapolitical Deconstruction Collective has a common genealogy, and it must have it, although it is lived differently by every one of its members, we must find it in our provenance. The common link is the university and the specific field of Latin American studies in it. Of course, the older members of the collective have more scars than the younger ones. I am one of the oldest, by the way. Mm -hmm. But this is all a matter of disciplinary history and can be traced back to texts and specific discussions and even events. After the late 90s, in our perception, the general cultural studies paradigm, which had already been used by us as an escape for the, from the constrictions of disciplinary life as we knew it, hit a wall and became unproductive, at least for us in Latin American studies. At the same time, the so-called political turn in cultural studies, which was an intensification of claims of political salvation through academic work, mm -hmm. although it included in principle a critique of identity politics in the name of universalism, became rather mechanical and dogmatic, and I would say it still is. A critique of the history of the left, quite neglected by the representatives of the so-called political turn, who seem to be much more invested in a mere repetition of the history of the left in modernity, provoked a general or even terminal dissatisfaction with available or dominant theoretical paradigms, both in the larger field of the humanities <coughs> and in the smaller field of the Latin Americanist humanities. Including, by the way, subalternism, which in retrospect had been the last illusion or delusion of the field. That's where I'm coming from. I was a member of the Latin American Subaltern Studies Group in the in the 90s. But finally, <coughs> Sergio Villalobos recently put it in a set of seminar notes, so-called, hmm, I quote from Sergio Villalobos, there was a need to move forward towards the constitution of a horizon of problems that could articulate a post-hegemonic understanding of the political, understood as a principal thought in Rainer Schurman's sense, and infrapolitics understood as a reflection on existence beyond political demand. Mm. Of course, this connects in all kinds of ways to contemporary Latin American politics, mm, to the current situation in Bolivia, in Argentina, in Ecuador, and so forth. In the meantime, the university was evolving into its neoliberal avatar and <coughs> ceased to be inter interesting as a usable institution, except in the most trivial sense, a relatively secure job, not to be dismissed. I would add that all of these negative or critical predispositions developed in the wake of a certain congenital marranismo, which is a Spanish word that is hard to translate, eh? marrano, marranismo, eh? a certain congenital marranismo, which we came to understand as the interesting side of the Hispanic intellectual and existential tradition, or at least the side of it we were interested in continuing to preserve. Eh? Okay. For instance, yesterday, Lydia, quoted Adorno, mm -hmm. um, home is the state of having escaped, okay? Of course, there are other definitions of home that could be equally persuasive, but I could argue that one is a specifically Marrano, a specifically infrapolitical understanding of home. Mm -hmm. The project of infrapolitics is only <laughs> derivatively or second, secondarily an academic practice. Most of us work at the university, and we do our work in the context of or the ruins of the university apparatus. Mm -hmm. But we understand all too well that the university is today subjected to conditions of production and reproduction, themselves derived from the ontotheological self-accomplishment of modernity that are incompatible with the future of the infrapolitical project. Infrapolitics is post-institutional to the very extent it seeks its necessary radicalization. We could see it as a modality of savage thought, or of what Catherine Malabou calls the, the eruption of the fantastic in philosophy, which of course overwhelms us as much as it calls us, destroys us as much as it informs us. But the fantastic in philosophy is about the time of life against the time of work. It must have become clear already that our project places itself in a tradition of thought marked by the work of Martin Heidegger, which it seeks to interpret 
or reinterpret by learning from a number of thinkers in its wake. From Rainer Schurman to Catherine Malabu, from Luz Irigaray and Maria Zambrano to Felipe Martinez Marzoa, Jacques Derrida, Jean-Luc Nancy, Massimo Cacciari, Mario Tronti, Agustin García Calvo, Georgia Gamben, Roberto Esposito, David Tarizzo, and of course many others. There is nothing too original here, except that we aim to keep alive a certain simplicity in Heidegger's thought that he himself covered up at times. And this is a problem that has repeated itself in the reception of Heidegger's work. If infrapolitical reflection is a sustained attempt at working out the subsiding passage from politics into a region of existence, politics occludes, this is not to be taken as a flight from politics, rather as an attempt to determine, even to thematize, the conditions under which an alternative conception of the political could become manifest. In Overcoming Metaphysics, a text written between 1936 and 1946, the Nazi period, <coughs> Heidegger indicates the possibility of historical opening into explicit infrapolitics when he says, apologies for the long quotation, but I think this is, a, this is a crucial quotation that of course can be interpreted in various ways. We do have one particular interpretation of it. I quote from Heidegger. The struggle between those in power and those who want to come to power. On every side, there is a struggle for power. Everywhere, power itself is what is determinative. Through this struggle for power, the being of power is posited in the being of its unconditional dominance by both sides. At the same time, however, one thing is still covered up here. The fact that this struggle is in the service of power and is willed by it. Power has overpowered these struggles in advance. The will to will alone empowers these struggles. Power, however, overpowers various kinds of humanity in such a way that it expropriates from the human the possibility of ever escaping from the oblivion of being on such paths. The struggle is planetary of necessity and as such undecidable in its being because it has nothing to decide since it remains excluded from a differentiation, from the difference and thus from truth. One may not like the tropology of being. One may have, may want to take exception to the ontological difference and so forth. But there remains the fact that an alternative politicality is announced that would not be blindly based on the will to will, of which in another section of the essay we are told that it can only bring about a collapse of the world and a devastation <coughs> of the earth. I quote, man wills himself as a volunteer of the will to will, for which all truth becomes that error which it needs in order to be able to guarantee for itself the illusion that the will to will can will nothing other than empty nothingness and so forth. We call all of these in political things hegemony, hmm? the struggle for power on both sides. We call it hegemony. And the search for hegemony is what is behind it. And the hegemonic conceptualization of politics of which one of its greatest interpreters, Ernesto Laclau, has said that it necessarily exhausts politics to, co to co as a whole. We disagree. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, Andrew Arato said something really interesting for me mm -hmm. about the difference between the Weberian and the Gramscian paradigm of legitimacy. I'd like to bring that up in the discussion if we can. At the same time, even if infrapolitical deconstruction aims to continue to let itself be inflected by the Heideggerian schematics concerning the history of being, the completion of metaphysics, the end of epochal history, the completion of principial thought, it is not our intention to be in favor of any particular valorization or indeed devalorization of particular historical cultural horizons or specific human profiles. The former list of our genealogical conditions should make it clear. The notion of value, of any form of cultural value, was already denounced by some of us as incompatible with a subalternist approach, even at its, mo as its most, at its most superficial. Our Maranismo has a few teeth, but not to chew on the exaltation or denigration of any form of human life. The ongoing publication of Heidegger's black notebooks makes it clearer than it ever has been 
that our project must also affirm a radical anti-Heideggerianism as well. If we take the Heideggerian scheme of the history of being as a variation on the Hegelian one, hmm, hence a non-renounceable part of the history of thought, in other words, what is at stake in the Heideggerian scheme of the history of being cannot be disentangled from the Hegelian uh, understanding of history. Okay? And, and we think that's what is irrenounceable in this, in this discussion. Mm -hmm. It is a non-renounceable part of the history of thought. Mm -hmm. The explicit intentional undertones revealed by the black notebooks, however, affirming an ontic or existential plunge, sturts mm -hmm, into both anti-Semitism and an overvaluation of German destiny in the preparation of a transformation of thought must be rejected, not just in themselves, but also as a master topology for any kind of alternative cultural historical valorization. This has been the problem with left Heideggerianism in the past. Mm -hmm. I don't know who might remember the famous Massimo Cacciari book from 1976 called Crisis, mm -hmm, which was an attempt to do uh, Heideggerian Marxism, and it was a catastrophic one. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it has been a rather endemic problem. Mm -hmm. So we need to reject not just the Heideggerian attempt at valorization, but also the tropology mm -hmm. that has led to some attempts at renewing Marxism. Mm -hmm. Infrapolitical reflection must affirm the radical suspension of any cultural historical valorization as just another form of principial thought, which as principial thought is and would be always already committed to hegemonic power and hegemonic accomplishment. The Heideggerian thematics of the end of epochal history can only be referred by us to the end of the hegemonic sacrificial structuration of history and historical life. Infrapolitical reflection abandons power as principal force, as the will to will, understood as the final principle of metaphysical history, for the sake of an anarchy, anarchy, whose foundations can be traced back to Heidegger as well, hmm? mediated, of course, by Emmanuel Levinas, by Ronald Schurman, by Maria Zambrano, Luce, Lucy Digaray, and others. There are two false exits from the Heideggerian schematic structuration of the completion of ontotheology, two false exits that infrapolitical deconstruction rejects. Mm -hmm. One of them is the rupture of the principle of general equivalence as the dominant structuration of folk hegemonic thought in our time. Would you cannot hear? Okay. One of them, one of those false exits. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of those false exits is the rupture of the, of the principle of general equivalence, which I would argue is the dominant structuration of all hegemonic thought in our time, mm -hmm. in favor of an alternative hierarchy, hierarchization. Mm -hmm. That is, the proposal of a new hegemony, mm -hmm. a new establishment of order and rank. Heidegger is explicit on this, in, for instance, the, the, the Beitrage. Mm -hmm. um, there is another false exit, however, and I am forced to conclude this paper by merely hinting at it. Mm -hmm. I will do it with another quotation from Heidegger, from Beitrege, Contributions to Philosophy. There, in the first section, in the prospect, under the heading Historicality and Being, Heidegger gives us a notion of double sovereignty, which we contend is the very possibility of a continued hegemonization of the time of life, which, of course, we reject in favor of what we call post-hegemony. This is what Heidegger says, I quote. Sovereignty over the masses who have become free must be erected and sustained within the with the shackles of organization. In this way, can what is thereby organized grow back in its original ground? Still another sovereignty is needed, one that is concealed and restrained and that for a long time will be sparse and quiet. Here the future ones must be prepared, those who create in being itself new locations. Mm. So two forms of sovereignty. <coughs> though fundamentally different, but both, Heidegger says, must be willed and simultaneously affirmed by those who know. Mm? This is the second false exit. The second false exit is the pretense that thinking or poetizing could change the nature of hegemony, that is, of sovereignty, that is, of a politics of the will to will, finally become conscious of itself. In contributions, Heidegger is clearly addressing his remarks to Nazi Germany, but there is a sense in which every structural compromise such as the one Heidegger is proposing here, of the thinker with the party, the principle of organization, the leading art, 
the leading arm of hegemonic power, will always result in the demand for a double structuration of sovereignty. We are seeing this in Latin America today. We think, however, that there is no non-somnambulic hero thought that can or should claim infrapolitical sovereignty. There is no infrapolitical sovereignty, and infrapolitical reflection claims no edge, no advantage over anything else. It is simply a wager for an otherwise of thought. We continue to reflect on this otherwise, which we have, time, have sometimes called transfigured infrapolitics. But I will have to leave that for another paper. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The thing that um, I'm trying to think of the two papers together, and one of the ways I can do that, I think probably the only way I can do that is to, uh, in terms of language, um, uh, the way that these, both of these words are these composite words, and um, the, the, the way that um, they are constructed suggests to me uh, a certain question about the space that these notions in some ways occupy. And um, I have kind of a, okay, obviously an aporia with uh, certain aspects of your uh, uh, paper, Alberto. Um, obviously, the word infra means, um, the, the prefix infra means under. Uh, and you did mention at one point you used a very interesting verb, underflows, which of course is a it's a bit more sophisticated than the one that immediately came to my mind, which is what underlies. But let's keep the, I'm, I'm totally into the flow, as it were, but let's just keep the notion of underlies. The, then I got a little confused when you said um, that politics occludes something, a certain space. So my question, first of all, would be, what is the space that politics occludes? This is not clear to me what that would be. Let's say, one could say, since you especially went into Heidegger, uh, that would be existence. But then, um, this isn't very satisfying to me because that would send me to a kind of sort of hard nature, which for me is just a, one tiny little step and into total metaphysics, right? I mean, um, a kind of metaphysical notion of being. And um, fine, um, you know, if we can say that um, that's the case, then th that metaphysical notion of being in many ways occludes the groundlessness of existence. The groundlessness of existence is crucial in order to have a politics, because only politics can, can um, it seems to me to be the primary mode of being on the basis of a certain groundlessness, over which, now we use the other side of infra, over which uh, you can say, other modes are um, laid, whatever they might be. So, in, you know, the under here is a, is a very problematic notion because un, the, in, in some ways there's nothing under politics. Okay, at least this would be what I would suggest, certain kind of void, there's nothing under politics. So what would be in for politics when there's nothing under politics? Um, and, you know, um, Max, the, the um, um, the, 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 I thought of a concrete example as you were talking from sort of my own experience, a uh, very problematic one. Uh, I think it was in the, I can't remember whether it was the date, late 80s, early 90s, when uh, uh, the Greek socialist government uh, essentially proclaimed a kind of erasure of the Civil War experience by, um, what was it? 80, yes. Uh, um, by early 80s, right. By, but what was then an agreement between the two parties right and left, and uh, what followed uh, the act, of, or the, what actually signified the act, was what we actually know, and we call it very sort of directly, the burning of the files, okay? <laughs> because literally, I don't know what the numbers are, I mean, nobody quite knows, but, but there was this total erasure of, 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 of data. Um, files, of course, was a, a very sort of a terrible term, criminalized term, because communists had files on them, and so, so um, the, the so the thing is, I mean, you in some you already alluded to the problem when you got to the discussion of Adorno. You <laughs> alluded to the problem of erasure and forgetting, which is which is uh, forgetting is is uh, and as Rebecca told us yesterday too is is embedded in amnesty. I mean, there there is no amnesty without forgetting. I think it's not because the Schmidt says so. It just that's the case. 
Uh, and and so the, it's not just a, the problem is not so much for me the morality, uh, the immorality of forgetting, but the fact that forgetting must happen simultaneously with a certain kind of, um, the exact opposite of that, which would be the over transparency. It's bringing to the fore everything. I mean, the problem with sort of truth and reconciliation issues is literally that that data disappears. When it, if, if it works at all, it is where all data is brought to the fore, where everything is known, which, which is the exact opposite of forgetting. So you have amnesty, meaning you have, we have to agree that the civil war has ended, otherwise we'll continue forever. But we do so by bringing to the fore all information. And then, of course, society has to deal with this issue of revenge. Um, so I want you to reflect on, on, on that, because it's not a two-step process. It's not forgetting and then the immorality of forgetting. It's simultaneous, it seems to me. And I don't know if it's a question of morality at all. Okay, that was very long, and I apologize. Stathis, well, thank you so much. I mean, that, that is a, a great question, okay, because it goes to the heart, of, obviously, of, of what is at stake, okay? So what you're saying is, well, it's not clear to me what politics includes because for me, and again, I'm using free and direct <laughs> speech here, because politics for me is already primary. Mm -hmm. Politics is the primary mode of, of being in the face of groundlessness, as you put it. Mm -hmm. There is nothing under politics. Mm -hmm. So if there is nothing under politics, what could infra politics be, you know? A mere invention that we are coming up with, okay? Well, that is, of course, the whole the whole project, okay? Mm -hmm. We claim, we claim that there is, mm, that politics is historical through and through. But when we say politics, mm, we are letting a lot go through our mouth, a lot that we do not realize, that we are naturalizing a certain understanding of politics, mm, that we are not understanding politics historically, that we take politics as a given, as a fact, mm, when actually politics is, is, is historically formed and it therefore lives, and again, you know, you may see the connection with subaltern studies here. Mm -hmm. uh, lives a lot unspoken for. You know, from the famous Gayatri spin-off formulation about the limit space where history is structured into logic. Mm -hmm. uh, this is part of what is at stake. Sorry, sorry. Um, but, but you're right that, um, and, and I have been explicit about that, okay? That the parallel here is with the understanding of the Heidegger. The, what Heidegger formulated in his early work mm, as the ontological difference, okay? The oblivion of the, of the, of the sense okay? of, the, of being, mm -hmm. okay? So we're trying to say, well, you know, in our contemporary notion of politics, mm, there is a forgetting occurring, okay? And that forgetting is guilty of any number of damaging uh, structurations of life, okay? Uh, and we are simply trying to unearth that, mm -hmm. okay? We're trying to unearth that underflow, okay? That subsess, mm -hmm. okay? That is necessarily underneath mm -hmm. our historically organized and historically structured understandings of politics. Mm -hmm. um, we have the same discomfort when it comes to using the word existence or the word experience. You know, we all have critiques of the notion of experience. We all have critiques of the notion of existence. <coughs> we certainly don't want to indulge uh, some of the Heideggerian jargon of authenticity or anything like this, okay? However, we have, and this is of course at an early stage yet, the project, right? Mm -hmm. But we are calling for a possibility of uncovering mm, an area of life, that we, what I call here the time of life as opposed to the time of work, okay? That is unaccounted for by our, our perceptions of politics, which, which are all thoroughly organized around the notion of hegemony mm, and counter-hegemony and so forth. So, I would say, in answer to, to you, Staff, is that for me, for us, perhaps I can speak for the group here, politics is not primary. Politics is secondary, secondary and derivative, okay? But the problem is we have no name for what is under politics. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah thank you, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I think that, I mean, I'm obviously not going to be able to give a, a single brief coherent position on memory politics. 
Uh, but I do think, I mean, two, two things struck me about the way that you, you formulated your response, and I, I which they're, they're, not, uh, they're not in disagreement with what you said. But one is that I think, <coughs> people are waving. Uh, I think that, um, the, uh, I mean, what you're referring to is often called the Spanish model, and it refers to, the, you know, the, not just Spain, but also Greece, and to a certain extent, Mozambique, and the idea that, um, um, certain kinds of official approaches toward reconciliation, toward political reconciliation after civil war, um, can be at least, in, you know, there's, there's some anecdotal evidence to suggest that they are in the long term better uh, able to generate sort of conditions of longer term political stability and security than these endless retributive cycles and investigations and blue ribbon commissions and panels and and long drawn out uh, prosecutions and the, 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 the whole, the whole uh, um, megilla of, of, um, of retributive justice. On the other hand, um, I think that when you make reference to files and data, um, what's glossed in that, uh, I, there's certainly a sense in which there's a sort of a, an image of jubilee. Uh, that's contained in the, 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 the ritual cleansing by fire of, uh, of all these files that have been generated on normal citizens trying to live their lives under an, a surveillance regime. And, and the idea of the, the jubilee burning of those files, uh, that sort of political auto da fe, is, is, has absolutely its attraction um, on, on any number of grounds. On the other hand, um, if you're talking about uh, a, 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 a society's attempt to rebuild a political culture. You have to remember that, what the, that that data also contains things like the fate of the disappeared. Uh, uh, people want to know what became of their loved ones, what happened to them, where they are. Uh, they become the grounds for uh, civil litigation in terms of the recovery of monetary damages for people who've been tortured, uh, for people whose, whose houses have been destroyed. And so uh, there's, a, uh, the, there's a sense in which data or files is too antiseptic a term when you talk about the actual um, evidentiary loss of all that information uh, that will um, no longer be available to people who might have very legitimate claims toward compensatory damages, and I, I think that that's important. There's another aspect as well, and I'll just end there, which is that the file image, the idea of, uh, of enforced forgetting in the, or destruction of memory in that, in that jubilee sense that, that you <laughs> that, that's popular with the Spanish model, doesn't translate especially well from the model of um, authoritarian states to that of failed states. Because they don't have, the failed states in, who are trying to recover from um, chronic or spectacular political or civil violence are generally not going to be the kinds of states that have that sort of commitment to uh, a security or surveillance apparatus. Uh, and so the problem in terms of um, uh, who's guilty and who's innocent and what you do with them has to be moved from a, a, a process that is forensic uh, to one that's different. Uh, so that one classic problem in, in um, post-conflict in sub-Saharan Africa and in, uh, the, 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 in, in, in uh, East Asia is what to do with actual perpetrators, who lower level perpetrators, who on the one hand have, who may not have a legal identity, for example, right? uh, who can't be reintegrated back to their home villages, uh, and who have one skill set, right? uh, and are going to take that skill set into the, into the capital. Right? Uh, so the idea, the, that's right. So, uh, so the idea there of, of, um, uh, uh, of establishing, not just non, not destroying, but establishing an extensive documentation of who people are, um, uh, what, their, what, what their name is, uh, where they're from, uh, and uh, uh, whether or not they've, they've disarmed, uh, is actually more uh, of, a, uh, of a relevance for, uh, contem for, for a lot of these situations than what they did or w w whether what they did can be, um, whether there's an evidentiary threshold past which what they did could be prosecuted. So it's a good idea to keep, onto those, keep hold of those records for a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah.
So I already have a dozen names on my list. Um, so, so we'll do two at a time and, and see how it goes, as the saying is. We have about 25 minutes. Does somebody leave um, me a pen? I left my pen in my coat pocket. I'll thank um, you. And otherwise, I won't remember. Thank you very much. But good. So, so Bonnie, then Andrew. I thought the papers went really well together, and I wanted to ask both of you um, about, uh, I guess I want to propose three possible ways of thinking about amnesty, Max. Um, should we think of it, and I think these are sort of at work in your, in your paper, but I'm not sure about the third one. Is it part of the political economy of sovereignty? And I think with Schmidt you were exploring that. Is it part of a moral economy? Um, which is often a source of critical engagement with sovereignty, and I think that's your Adorno move. Um, and, or is it part of an infrapolitics that wants to ungovern, um, which I think is not the move you made, but maybe your co-panelist might have made. Um, and an example that I would offer you to add to Schmidt and Adorno of someone who makes that argument in addition to your co-panelist um, might be someone like Nicole Leroux, who writes about amnesty in the context of the ancient Greek polis. And for her, the amnesty after um, the fall of the tyrants is a way of doing an accounting without exacting an accounting. In other words, the amnesty dismisses, forgets, but also enshrines the memory of what happened. That's sort of what's great about it for her. Um, so the reason I'm asking these questions is because I think um, what might be the most interesting about amnesty is the last one, which is its quest for a kind of ungovernedness um, or it, uh, its, uh, its uh, excessiveness to any particular economy. In other words, it could be brought into being part of a political economy of sovereignty. It can be absorbed into a moral economy, but maybe it exceeds that also. And I think the examples that we use of amnesty when we're thinking about it, as you did so well, um, drive how we think about it in certain directions. So if we start with Schmidt in 1949, we want moral economy. <laughs> I mean, we know what was going on with Schmidt in 1949 and before and after, so you know, we're just driven into the moral um, judgment of that claim and we're, we're all with Adorno. But what if we looked at a couple of other examples, and then this is really a question for both of you. One example that I thought of while I was listening was that of jury nullification. It's not a pardon. Right? It's before um, judgment is, is made of a, a crime. It's aimed, it's an action that's aimed at sovereign charges. It's actually an act of counter-sovereignty, which is ordinary people gathered together and told to judge the criminal. And instead, the nullification is a kind of amnesty. And instead, they judge the law. And they judge the law in a way that ha can have the effect of altering the law or altering the norms by which the law is um, uh, fixed. Uh, like in a racial context of drug sentencing, for example. Um, and then, so that's, so that's just one example where you would have a completely different comportment towards it, towards the idea of amnesty than you would be driven to by, um, I think we're driven into moralism by Schmidt. I'm wondering if we can be driven into infrapolitics by a different example. Um, another example where we don't have amnesty yet is for uh, WikiLeaks, Julian Assange or Chelsea Manning. Um, and there, I think it, that's an interesting example to think about because it shows you the extent to which amnesty is always already part of a moral or political economy, and insofar as it also exceeds that in Leroux's, uh, as Leroux invites us to think about it, maybe the impossibility of such an amnesty for people like that shows us how absorbed it is and how its power how it, that could exceed those absorptions has yet to be uh, understood and harnessed in what might be an infrapolitical way. So that's the question. And so this will be pretty short. I don't know how beautiful it will be, uh, but you decide. Uh, uh, so let's assume a, a hypothetical and at the moment highly unlikely situation that in some process of negotiations, uh, uh, the Israeli Jewish side, uh, the, as I would prefer, the uh, Arab parties in Israel and uh, groups, parties representing the West Bank and Gaza come to some kind of political agreement. And in that political agreement, uh, they uh, 
give each other amnesty with respect to domestic amnesty, with respect to all the obvious crimes that both sides have committed over many of these years. I mean, it's, it's imaginable, even though not politically at the moment mm -hmm. uh, at all likely. Uh, so in that setting, uh, and I'm not talking about now the PEA going to the International Criminal Court in this setting, I'm talking about that setting, uh, would we want uh, uh, some international uh, agency to begin to, uh, 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 to declare the illegitimacy of that amnesty? And when one of the negotiants travels uh, to an unhappy place like Belgium or Spain, uh, they could be arrested and tried, sent to The Hague, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, I think you extremely well set up the problem, right? Uh, there's a moral problem because there are arguments on both sides for and against domestic amnesties. I think you kind of weighed the anti-amnesty side talking about the moral, but uh, you may not. Uh, uh, and I think they're equal arguments probably. One side based on peace, the other side based on justice, the way I would put it. You presented the political side, the political debate too, but I, I, I think that uh, uh, Contrary to perhaps what you were saying in terms of all these examples, uh, the, the overwhelming uh, 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 argument on a political level is for domestic amnesties under some conditions. Uh, this forgetting issue is a red herring. I mean, Carl Schmitt in '48 had lots to forget. <laughs> he had lots to forget. Uh, but there's no logical, contrary to what status and now there, said, I see no logical connection of amnesty and forgetting. As a matter of fact, that's the whole point of the truth and reconciliation, uh, to make sure there's no forgetting. And in any case, only in an authoritarian system can you produce forgetting because people can continue to write books and say all kinds of things, so where is the forgetting? I think that uh, the political argument uh, uh, is extremely strong, and I, and I suspect that you even had in this, which is always, of course, good, uh, behind it lies a kind of cosmopolitan preference for morality uh, as against politics, uh, which I think in terms of ethics of responsibility under conditions in which there's no world authority that can enforce any kind of order is irresponsible. But maybe that's just me and maybe I'm just pragmatic and maybe, you know, I, I operate on a low political level <coughs> and, and in, you know, such wonderful group where people pay attention to so many great things. Uh, this sounds stupid, mm -hmm. but it's not stupid to the participants, and they will never make peace uh, on, on the conditions of an interventionist international attitude uh, if they actually believed uh, uh, that that attitude could actually trump uh, uh, the agreements that they make. And this is not just uh, in terms of the example I, I selected, which I think is of interest of a lot of people here. Uh, this was true in lots of other places, and I think it was true in South Africa. We forget that to the very last moment, the South African military could have defeated uh, uh, the deliberation mm -hmm. movement. To the very end, they could have always won a military struggle or, of course, with great cost to themselves. So under what conditions can you get them to do this? And yeah, well, the leaders of the ANC knew better than, than, you know, than, than you know, many students of literature and, and even political philosophy know. Thank you. Want to start? Was that beautiful? Mm. <laughs> it, it, it was horribly well formed. <laughs> yep. Oh, I, I think I think Andrew is right. I think that um, obviously the the risk of the kind of position, the moralizing position that I'm taking, is that it's is that it's really a sort of a Gesinnungs ethic that doesn't bode well for international peace and cooperation. I also think, I also think that it's true, and I also agree with Andrew, that were, I, you don't even need to, to be as dramatic as Israel and the Palestinians. I think that, I mean, the question would be something like this. Would the International Criminal Court um, regard um, a flagrant amnesty for um, serious violations of international law uh, a la the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the second half of the 1990s, would they regard that as triggering their jurisdiction under Article 17 of the Rome Statute? And the answer is yes, they would. Um, but that's 
as far as I'd be willing to speculate, right? I mean, there are, there are, there are I mean, I'm not here to defend the ICC. I do, th but, but just on a factual basis, there are, lot, there are a number of steps that we leave out bef in, before we get from that to the ICC wades in and fucks up what could have been a perfectly fine peace agreement, right? There are, there's all kinds of issues about complementarity. There's all kinds of issues about uh, prosecutorial discretion. There's the fail-safe of the UN Security Council and its, its deferral mechanism. So I think that um, as a matter of political reality, if you were to have a, an amnesty that had certain kinds of accountability mechanisms attached to it, and that those accountability mechanisms had some, some realistic chance of meaningful enforcement, and you thought that um, um, objectionable as it is in other ways, that the prospects for long-term settlement of chronic political violence were very high, I, it's very hard for me to imagine that um, a, a scenario where the International Criminal Court on its own steam would, right. would, me would mess it up. I don't think so. What I was trying to, uh, I mean, but that's, who knows, I don't, but uh, that's, that, that's neither here nor there, and I certainly wouldn't want it to myself. I certainly would hope that some of those, those fail-safe mechanisms would intrude. I'm not arguing here that uh, justice must triumph even if the, the world perishes. I am trying to think, and this goes back, I think, uh, to, to Bonnie's question, I, I, am, uh, I am saying that um, the, 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 uh, the dialectic structure that I gave this little talk here left out the third thing. And the third thing is what you mentioned. And, it, and it's what the, the second talk was about, which is um, one way to talk about would be in for politics. The other way to talk about would, would, you, would just be the interesting, messy part. Right? And part of the interesting, messy part would be is that we, we see in, in what the stuff I'm working on is I try to give you an argument that <clears throat> I have an explanation that lawyers don't have for why even countries that sign on on paper to the anti-impunity norm amnesty more rather than less. And I thought, and my, my argument was pure reasons of state, pure rational calculation of, of cost and benefit only get you so far. Otherwise, after that, you have to get to this, this weird expressive power, right? Having said that, what's interesting is how unpredictable it becomes what is expressed, right? And who interprets it how. So for instance, um, it, uh, there's, there's a lot of, if you wade through the actual literature on the actual implementation and effects of amnesty policies, say, since after about 2005, um, uh, you, you come up with all kinds of odd infra-political things. So, an amnesty policy could definitely be a way of, uh, mm -hmm. of saying, I'm cooperating with this international norm, but I'm kind of not, mm -hmm. right? I'm cooperating with this international norm by expressing it to the international community that we here in whatever are prepared to live up to our international legal obligations and signal to you guys that we are a, an equal sovereign state in good standing in the, in the UN order. But to the, my domestic audience, I'm also saying, we will never allow this international community to push us around. Conversely, Sometimes amnesties can be signals uh, to the international order that we would rather shift the cost of prosecution onto you people, right? Because A, it's too expensive politically. B, our criminal justice system sucks, right? So by amnestying somebody, right, uh, we can actually give, we can actually express uh, over, this is, a, this is a sort of a moral hazard, as it were, of the, of the institution, the, the instauration of this international legal order, where you can say, uh, the amnesty is sort of a little red blinking light that maybe the international legal community might want to pay attention to this, these people. We're not going to prosecute them. We're telling you we're not going to prosecute them. If you would, we would, make, we would uh, grease the skids for that to happen. So, um, I mean, I take this to be... Or both. Was that? Or, or both, both, or neither. <laughs> yeah. um, I take this to be, in one way, all the interesting stuff that happens between the two uh, sides that, that you identified. On the one hand, the moral indignation about the destruction of memory, which I take, to be, which I take quite seriously. On the other hand, the, um, the alchemy of, of time and sovereignty that, that, sovereign, that acts of memory, uh, the acts of amnesty invoke. Um, and I think it's in that force field that all the interesting stuff happens. And I think that that's what you seem to have been. So, that, so I agree 100%. Thank you.
Richard? Yeah, I'll, I'll reply very briefly because I am concerned about the rest of the, of the people that want to ask questions. Well, Bonnie, for instance, in Spain there is a lot of talk today about the second transition. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, the first transition, as you will remember, happened between the death of Franco, 75, and 1981, essentially. And it was judged by all measures as a very successful political transition, right? But then, of course, recently a lot of people are saying, well, you know, something escaped that first transition, something was left out, you know, some historical dimension, sub substance. And of course, this happened through any number of amnesties, you know, on both sides, okay? Amnesty to ETA, amnesty to Grapo, but also amnesty to the Francoists themselves. It was a very successful transition, but something escaped that transition, something that cannot be named, something that cannot be identified. And this is what supposedly Podemos is after, right? The new group. Podemos wants to organize a second transition. They are orchestrating a new myth, a new myth, the myth of the second Spanish transition to democracy. <coughs> but this myth is no longer an infrapolitical myth. That is, in the name of infrapolitics, they have gone back through, through it to purely hegemonic politics, mm -hmm. and they are reconstructing hegemony, mm -hmm. okay? In a sense, that is going to lift a lot of things escaping. Things will continue to escape because of, because of the nature of the political game. The need to constitute a party, the need to participate in elections, the need to, the need to participate in politics as we know them, you know? So that uh, whatever escapes, whatever escapes for me leaves the, leaves the possibility of democratic invention behind. That's why I think this is very serious and important, okay? Certainly for Spain, but also for Bolivia, for instance, okay? Where, where the opportunity of democratic invention has to a bit, to certain extent be sacrificed. And the same thing may happen in Spain. Mm -hmm. Emily and Rebecca. Yeah, that's the thing which is close to And and this kind of politics is under and it doesn't rise to the surface or in a sense attain some sort of principial or um, or even political process uh, visibility. And so it, it I think it's associated to some extent with an invisibility politics that, um, but not just that it's not represented, that it's, a, it's, and I think you in another context refer to this messy, this messy that doesn't somehow contain. So uh, I was wondering if you would see the infra going in a sense towards that, that field of messiness and inarticulability that's not quite just the invisible non-represented subject. So we think Rebecca? Um, just in order, um, yeah, in the in, in interest of brevity, I'm just going to direct this to, um, to Max about, about uh, continuing on Bonnie's question, I guess, in the discussion that's followed up from that, um, with, with, with respect to memory politics, I mean, taking into account the, pursuing the Adornian line on the, this question of um, the way in which political hygiene and the instrumental reason that goes with that, you know, has... Um, has evacuated memory, um, and, and this is, I don't take this to be simply a moral thing. Also, I mean, I think it's also a political point, but this is the difficult thing. Um, the, and, and this is where I'm not quite sure that the Athenian 403 model exactly holds now. But it's interesting that you know the, the post-South African model of truth and reconciliation seems to be twinning an official, pol an official politics of forgetting if that's what amnesty is, with this, you know, sidebar of official, official remembering, mm -hmm. right? So these, these, these testimonies, which are produced in a quasi-juridical way. Very juridical way. Yeah, well, in, certainly <coughs> theatrically juridical, but it's, it takes the form. So is that a substitute? Is it, is, it, is it a compensatory form of memory to sort of cancel out the forgetting? Is it, is it part of, is it, is it another you know, place of memory in the sense of a, an official site of memory, like a, like a memorial or a monument, which will, you know, acts, you know, acts in, in this official way to, to channel oblivion in such a way that there's a, you know, that you have this, these fetish memories 
doing it for you? Are they, is it a screen memory being produced so it's such that the deeper forgetting will be perpetuated? Is it ideologically inflected in terms of you know, the, the, the nation building project? I'm just wondering if you can comment about the, these, these various strands of official memory and the sort of, sort of almost hypertropic memory culture that seems to be mm -hmm. part of the discourse of amnesty. Okay. Alberta? Well, we'll start <coughs> because that's another crucial question. I need to clarify what might be in the works. Um, I think Robin Kelly and James Scott's notion of infrapolitics, which are also uh, formulated in the name of asserting anarchism, mm -hmm. um, are very uh, important and useful for us. Um, I, would, I would associate those positions, those, those definitions of infrapolitics, those conceptions of infrapolitics to what, what we call subalternism or, or even post-subalternist work, okay? Um, and we, you know, we embrace and accept all of that. But I think that our interest is not to indulge all too soon in, in, the, in the reformulation of infrapolitics as an, as an alternative politics of an alternative subject, you know? As a, as a new anthropology of politics, mm -hmm. okay? We don't want to make that, that step. In other words, we are coming from taking, taking a step back from that, you know, from subalternism back into, into something other. That doesn't mean that all of these practices that you mentioned and others that we could mention, for instance, in a recent discussion, uh, Pablo Dominguez Galvez brought up uh, the, 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 the immigrants of La Bestia, the famous train that goes from Central America to to the U.S. border, you know, and talking about infrapolitical lives in that context, you know, or, you know, narco lives in general, mm -hmm. Marrano lives in general, you know, any number of these people. Of course, people who, people who are not political subjects in any kind of traditional sense, people that do not become politically subjectified, you know, you were discussing Badiou yesterday, you know. The politics of the non-subject, can they be infrapolitics? Well, to a certain extent, yes, if they are politics of the non-subject, they are probably better called infra-politics in order not to confuse <laughs> the, the definition of political subjectivation, right? But again, I think it is important for us not to fall into anthropological understandings of the concept because that kind of will kill, you know, will domesticate infra-politics into just another uh, niche for political thought. Mm -hmm and just another attempt at counter-hegemonic uh, claims and counter-hegemonic formations, which we want to avoid. Provisionally, you know, who knows what we'll do in the future, but at this point, that's where we are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the, with, this, with this tiny little paper, I, can't really, I didn't really get into all the, the many complexities of sort of the ethics and politics of memory and forgetting. I would say, I guess, that um, in, there's a strong sense that, that you know, what, what Freud thought about the persons is, is probably right here, is, is that it's a mistake to think of memory as retention and forgetting as loss. Uh, because in the, in the way that we're look, thinking about it, that the, these acts of forgetting here are productive or constructive. Um, they, they, they involve producing psychic contents rather than simply getting rid of them. And I think that, in that sense, the, the, the specific connotation of, uh, the, the specific point, I, th I think, in connecting amnesty with oblivion or forgetting is not we must simply lose content. It's we must create structures in which the status, the, the, the temporal or historical status of enmity between groups and persons cannot be taken as a reason for various kinds of, or as a non-prudential, I would say, reason, uh, for various kinds of future policies. Now, that's supposed to be an official act uh, that will uh, channel, if not preempt, future developments of, of a political culture. And it seems to me that, um, that um, political cultures don't get formed by official acts. I mean, it seems to me, I mean, it seems to anybody, you know, it's obviously, Political cultures, I mean, this, I'm, I just go back all the way to the old, the good old American ver vision of political culture and the work of somebody like Almond and Verba, which is to say that um, 
political cultures are subsist largely in the, the, the in the way in which um, certain kinds of shared normative interpretations and expectations are drawn upon for uh, people to motivate people to occupy political institutions in certain ways. And that means that working through the process of memory in that sense is, is not an official act. Uh, it's an, uh, and, and therefore memory, the memory politics is, is, a, is, is, if it's going to be successful at all by any criterion you want, is going to be successful by virtue of what then subsequently became of the political culture of the society. Right? Um, the, the, um, the, so the political side, uh, not just the moral side, that, that is worrisome here is um, why try to either preempt or strictly channel the outcome of that process in advance on the basis of what kind of consideration? Um, I guess that's what I would say. I'm not quite sure that that answered your question exactly, but, but I, I guess in some, the, the site of memory politics is political culture. Political culture is both political and, and moral at the same time. It is not official, but is not f free from official involvement either. So the question, therefore, is the degree and kind of sovereign intervention into that process that is, um, that we're going to take to be, you know, sort of acceptable for democratic politics. So we're, we're already past time, but I suggest the following, because I have a preference to hear lots of voices. So what I suggest is the following, that each of the people on my list ask their question. We'll just have all the questions, and then you choose to answer I love it. A, a brief thing. <laughs> Not try to answer each question, but you know, because I think, I think it's so important to hear the various things. Mm. So the order we're going to be uh, Lydia, Jason, Dimitri, Nadia, Andreas, Annie, and Timothy. Okay. It's a long list. Keep, that's why I, but, but I think hearing the different sides are important. Lydia. The trouble is waiting so long to ask your question, it gets more and more complicated. But, um, uh, so my first response about an hour ago <laughs> to your papers uh, was to both the political or politics and amnesty. My initial reaction was that neither of them were actually political concepts. Um, and then my thought was, as I've been sitting thinking and thinking, um, that in fact they um, both have a very strange structure, that they're both political concepts because they serve against um, the actual sort of political status quo or the political practice. And I was thinking for the infopolitics, the one thing calls it an infopolitics, but only infopolitical. I was thinking of um, Adorno's way of these distinctions between um, doch arbeiten und der arbeiten und auch arbeiten, and or um, the gegen Öffentlichkeit. The gegen means that you have these political concepts that are always working against the political reality, exposing, the, say, false rationalizations of amnesty law. And it means that they become interesting concepts because they can't then just get manifested in political practice directly. Um, so they actually fall very well into Rebecca's concept of resistance. Um, so I was just thinking we might make a distinction, or draw a distinction between the political and politics, and that seems so bloody obvious, but there it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Jason. Was short. Yes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to pass mine because Bonnie's question really captured. Okay, okay. Dimitri. Just by. Yeah, he's already. And just close. Okay, thank you. My, uh, my question is for uh, uh, Max. Thank you for it. Paper and uh, another version of the question about uh, memory. And then I'd uh, like to ask you to comment once again uh, on the relation between uh, moral and political amnesty. Because I uh, take it that the paradigm case here in, uh, uh, for amnesty is uh, really the crime against humanity, those three horrible crimes, genocide. And this is uh, 
uh, makes of course uh, Adorno's concern very understandable that if we understand amnesty as total oblivion, then uh, we are not doing justice to history. And here I, 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 I very much agree with uh, uh, Yerushalmi's uh, claim that Zohar, remember, is an absolute moral imperative. Uh, that we must remember not uh, only the victims, but uh, in general everyone who's dead, uh, is our, to, to the extent we can. This is our moral responsibility also in the level of collective memory and individual uh, uh, memory. So we should not forget this, I, I think this is moral responsibility. Uh, of, of course, you could also here go uh, the way Derrida tried to go on this, <coughs> and only uh, the way of uh, forgiveness. And so Derrida, who liked uh, all kinds of uh, aporias, and in case there was no aporia, he was constructed one, constructed the uh, aporia of forgiveness, uh, which uh, ran as follows. Uh, in cases like that, uh, we must forgive because it, it is impossible. Forgiveness is impossible, therefore we must forgive. For, forgive uh, but I think it, it's also not uh, the way to go. We should not forgive and we should not forget. But in, in cases, uh, sometimes in cases you have mentioned, you know, to avoid the way to force civil we uh, might really need to go the way of amnesty. And so here I think it's, uh, that's my interpretation of what you said. That in fact, amnesty amounts to some kind of legal procedure, legal suspension of law, a kind of reflective uh, moment in law, which is based on very careful political moderation. Right. Yeah? Now, in this case, of course, politics is starkly separated from, uh, from moral consideration. Sure. The moral consideration, as I said, is there. We must remember, by all means, everything that we can collect, that we can uh, remember, we must remember. But amnesty, once it is really necessary in order to avoid civil strife or uh, uh, stasis, yeah? Uh, is then it would be really a legal suspension of law based on the political situation. Nadia? <coughs> Thank you. Um, yes, concerning memory again, um, there is an interesting case uh, because of my country. They, they, had, they, they made a decision once the constitution was uh, passed in force, the new democratic constitution, to uh, have an amnesty. But the Constitution declared that uh, that Constitution was anti-fascist. So the declaration, politically speaking, of an identity, of what they were not, they could not be anymore, they wanted not to be anymore, implied that they could have, and they made actually an amnesty. But they, meanwhile, and this is a question of moral in politics, politics commands also morals in some sense, uh, they produce a um, process of uh, memory all for years after that. So the Constitution said something that implied not amnesty, but they had amnesty, but on the same time uh, they declare that they would never forget. Okay. So it's, uh, this, it's uh, crucial because uh, it's nothing to do forgetfulness with the, the sense of amnesty. You have an amnesty and you don't forget. Actually, you declare that you don't want to forget at all. This is interesting. The, la the, the other question is to do with um, other forms of forget forgetting. Today, the European Union passed, today, not today, I mean these days, passed a new law or a right concerning there to be for forgotten mm, in relation to uh, the mm, internet and I don't know what to think about that. There is a pro and cons, but this is an interesting uh, expansion of the notion of amnesty in ordinary life in relation to technological mm -hmm. in, uh, in intrusion in our life and so on and so forth. As for uh, Alberto, um, infra politics, uh, uh, of course, politics it's to, has to do also with the um, ability of giving voice, of creating voice to those who are not. Uh, definable political in the classical way. There are new movements, uh, new entities, or new uh, claims. Uh, I don't understand why you say that is, is shouldn't be political or is something else. Infra politics is non-politics or is a politics or impolitical. How can you 
give this strong uh, definition on human actions, public actions, uh, uh, they, they are making a political claim or, or they state themselves as political actors even in the moment that they, they leave their countries, they attack their, uh, the law of the countries even violently. So in some sense, everything is political. And this doesn't mean to be hegemonizing uh, politics. Uh, you can have uh, uh, this view. So. Yes, just continue with, uh, uh, for Alberto. Uh, so it sounded to me that uh, your version of in infrapolitics is a kind of a critical discourse of uh, what you call hegemonic politics. But it's a critique that does not try to conceal its critical voice because it does not tell us what's problem. What's the problem with hegemonic politics? With hegemo what's the problem with hegemony? What's the problem with politics? And um, what are the, let's say, the animating concerns uh, that this critique uh, tries to uh, articulate? So, in that sense, if it's a concealed critique, I would say it's a very hegemonic political discourse, this kind of thing from politics, and does exactly the same that what politics uh, is supposed to do. Um, now, for <coughs> Marx, Marx uh, very quickly, that might not relate directly to, to, what, um, to the emphasis on your paper, just out of curiosity. Uh, do you think, uh, under which conditions uh, uh, do you think that uh, anti-impunity norms uh, um, might escape uh, the, the justice of the victors? That is, uh, um, maybe Amnesty has many problems, but at the same time it tries uh, a little bit uh, to uh, suspend uh, some unequal power relations in relation, especially after civil wars. Uh, the one we, who wins usually wins out of factual power. And then uh, uh, transform this factual power into a legal norm in order to, press, to <coughs> uh, prosecute the, the, the losers. So, how do you, uh, this happened, let's say, in the Greek civil war. The, the, the right won uh, and put all the the communists into camps, uh, trials. Uh, so on, on, on what grounds do you, on, on, in what cases do you think uh, um, this kind of anti-impunity can just become the, to, 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 to use Thrasimachus' version, the advantage of the more powerful after a, a civil strife? Mm -hmm. Can I answer that? No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for both of your papers. I uh, really I learned a lot. But um, so I'm concerned about um, this thing of forgetting, I'm sorry. Not only do I, I, I think it's a red herring, I think that, as, as Andrew put it, I think we're kind of caught in a vocabulary that's already been ordained for us. And I'm not sure that forgetting and memory is even what any of this is about. I think people live inside different temporalities and sedimentations of them and have uh, politics of what they imagine is a relevant way to understand the world they are in any moment. People just, they don't forget. I mean, this is everything I work on in colonial histories. People are not forgetting. The French love to talk about oubli, 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 but it's never about oubli at all. It's about constructing grids of intelligibility, whatever language, it doesn't have to be Foucault, um, whatever it, it is. <laughs> anyway. Yes, you do. Um, it could be, no, 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 I'm really serious about this because uh, it, we, we're, we're reproducing actually the very categories that I think absolutely get in the way of understanding the ways in which this is never a matter of forgetting. It is realigning, it's recalibrating, it's providing another grammar, it's doing, we could say, providing another regime of truth that makes something sensible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there for the moment. But I feel like we just keep reiterating it and tweaking it when it's not a matter of tweaking, but it's actually a matter of throwing it out. Um, secondly, on the infra, I was kind of concerned about this because I kind of felt like feminism's understanding, and they're, you know, much more informed feminists here than, uh, than, than just, uh, uh, than, than myself. Um, but that, that, that the infra has always been a potentiality inside feminism for a very long time. And I'm not just talking about the personal is political. And I'm not just talking about um, salt of the earth where, where women took over the strike, made it political over how much water there was to wash the dishes. I mean that infra has just been essentially a, a, a critical space of redefining the political 
um, it, it's the center of, of feminism. And so there was something very male about this discussion. And I wondered, <laughs> I know, I know you are. And I know, you, I know that you, 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 you quoted Catherine, you know. Um, but, but, you know, I, I'm confused by it. It feels like a placeholder of something right now, of a potentiality. Yeah, we want, we were all here for five years doing this, and many years before that, um, Adi and others, trying to understand what the political is for this moment, the Kantian question, what is our now? Now, and so, I didn't understand if it was, you were suggesting it was an anticipatory space. It's a, the placeholder for this anticipation of what could be rather than what is, um, or a kind of sensibility, which Raymond Williams, beyond semantic availability to us. It's already emergent, but we, we can't call it anything yet. Right? Raymond Williams has been arguing that since 1970s. So, so I'm a little bit, you know, um, puzzled by, what this thing is that's so, you know, is it, I don't know. I'm, I, I, need, I, don't, I, don't, I really am not getting it. I, I feel like there's a, a genealogy that's been kind of set aside in it, and I don't know what else was had. Timothy, last one. Okay, really good. Thank you. Uh, I would try to be uh, yeah, brief. Um, um, I, I, yeah, I think I do know what, you, what uh, Alberto is talking about, and um, I want to just ask a question about it. Um, uh, I think there are connections that you were tracing with some of the papers that were given um, earlier, and I, but I thought what was very distinct was the way that your, your very strong statement that there is no infrapolitical sovereignty. Um, and the figure that I was thinking of during your paper, I, 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 you mentioned a lot of kind of you know uh, contemporary European thinkers, but I was thinking of Ranzier a lot, and in particular, sure. well, in particular, I mean, for, for Ranzier, it's not an infrapolitical. Um, concept, it's, the polit it's politics, and, and he makes three, I think, really interesting statements. One, one is that there's no natural subject of politics and no, no proper place of the political. That sounds to me very similar to the way that you're describing the, the infra-politics. Um, there's also the no notion of dissensus, of course, uh, a kind of unending, perpetual <coughs> sort of dissensus that never quite closes upon any kind of consensus. And then thirdly, the, 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 the pol politics as defined as the redistribution of the sensible. And so I, I was um, very interested in, in, in that kind of connection, wondered what your response to it was. And also what your response was in general to the very ready taking up of, of the term infrapolitical almost immediately in the Q&A. And uh, uh, I mean, it seems to have been a, 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 a recognizable concept actually that people have wanted to use and what what I would what I was wondering yes and what what, I, what how I, I wonder do you respond in particular to what I take to be Max's insinuation perhaps or casual um, uh, use of the term as something like a kind of rhetoric a kind of rhetoric of evasiveness I thought that that, that was what you were kind of casually uh, uh, appending to the term yeah, a kind of rhetoric, in other words. There's an infrapolitical rhetoric. Um. Kind that we are trying to move away from every possible notion of subjectivation, okay? This, I mean, we love Rancière, okay? <coughs> Rancière has been an important element in our discussions. But so, you know, we love Lucy Viganay and Elaine Sixou as well, not just Catherine and Malabo. Um, and by the way, the very important Spanish philosopher, Maria Zambrano, okay? But they are all philosophers of subjectivation, which we want to avoid. You know, that's why we are not going to declare this a feminist project or a subalternist project, because those would imply the possibility of formation of a subject. Okay? So we are not I think we are not attempting a, an anticipatory, you know, event, you know, or anticipating an event. It really is more a question of sensibility. Okay? Of what? Sensibility. As you sensibility is yeah, Developing a gaze, okay, establishing the possibility of a passage for a for a, for an understanding of the political, mm -hmm. who, uh, where the central category would not be <coughs> the category of subject of subjectivation. That seems to be the problem with hegemony and hegemony theory in general. Okay, and again, we have had many discussions with Ernesto Laclau, who was alive with Yanis Stavrakakis recently about precisely these very issues. You know. Of 
of the import, the crucial importance of the Sanji, the, the unavowed, disavowed mm -hmm, centrality of the Cartesian subject in our understanding of politics okay, today, mm -hmm. which is precisely what we're trying to move away from. Mm -hmm. I will do that. Okay, Max? Um, yeah, let me just collapse in together a response to Andreas and Anne, both of them made really good points. I think, and this goes back to what, um, uh, to what Andrew was saying too, I, I think that there's a, a distance between two, uh, two worries. One is that memory and forgetting are red herrings, and the other is that uh, surely there are some more subtle and more efficient concepts than these two which are basically oriented towards psychological process on the part of individual consciousness to refer to these processes. And so I, I take the second one without taking the first. And I think that, um, you know, just a, a, a field report, a huge three-day conference on critical social memory studies, this is all everybody talks about. It's like, why do we call it memory? Um, and the answer is, because that's what we call it. So there's a certain kind of customary stare decisis kind of like weight of the weight of precedent here that, um, uh, but, but there's a sort of a widespread, I think, recognition that, um, uh, that's documented by just all the work that one has to do to hedge and qualify and saying, well, by, by forgetting, I don't really mean like forgetting, nor by memory do I actually mean, you know, memory. So this, there, there's obviously, speaking of political concepts, there's political concepts that we just simply don't have. Uh, and uh, we would have to go and, and create them. Um, part of the difference between recognizing that memory and forgetting are are inadequate placeholder concepts uh, on the one side, and the other hand, simply dismissing them outright is the space where that kind of creative work would have to happen. Um, Andreas's is, is, uh, point is, 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 simply, uh, is simply this. I mean, um, let us, you know, on the, uh, on the assumption that, um, that a lot of what we now refer to as the regime, the, the normative foundation, the normative foundations of the regime of international law uh, rests on the, the purely contingent fact that the right side, the correct side, won the Second World War, right? Um, and uh, given the fact that, you know, fortunately the correct side won the Second World War, uh, uh, imagine how conflicted and messy the legacy of the Nuremberg of Nuremberg is. I mean, the, 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 I mean, the, the, you know, a lot of the a lot of the defendants were quite, you know, made up had a point when they objected that that. Um, Nuremberg violated a core principle of the rule of law, which is the principle that rules out retroactivity. Right? They're being prosecuted for crimes that didn't exist uh, at the moment that they com committed them. Um, but the other major one is the idea of victor's justice. Now, I'm, I mean, a Andrew made reference to this yesterday. I mean, I'm more or less in the sort of the Ben Habibian cosmopolitanist camp without being nearly as, as sanguine as, as Shayla is about the prospects for um, the, uh, the, the solidification of the normative and political uh, side of what, is, what are now legal institutions of international, of international law. I think, uh, actually, uh, that uh, if I had to look ahead in my crystal ball for 20 years, I would see that you know, future us, uh, 20 years from now, once we're all nice and retired, will say, isn't it interesting that something, institutions like the International Criminal Court were able to come about in that brief little window between 1989 and 2001? I mean, it certainly wouldn't happen now, right? Nobody could imagine the International Criminal Court or the Rome Statute getting the kind of support now that it got in uh, back then. Uh, and so it's, it, it's in some sense, I, I don't think it was an institution that was failed to, that was designed to fail as many people was. I think it was an institution that, that expresses a certain historical window that is, that is three quarters shut hmm. and descending so that, um, in some sense, my interest is, is uh, unlike somebody like Shayla's, is actually rather forensic, to be honest with you. And in that spirit, it is interesting to me uh, how we are stuck, we, I, people, like, people who think like I do, are stuck between um, a, a, a realist conception that universalist legal and political norms are, uni are the, the norms of, of certain kinds of normative hegemons, always have been. On the other hand, they are norms that I personally endorse. So, so I mean, that's, there's worse problems to have than that, but it is certainly a problem, and I think that, and I think that it's not a solvable problem as long as there is Im actual empirical politics, like powerful people wanting to have their way, and their way actually corresponds to things that I think that we would independently of them have good reason to want. So, uh, is it victor's justice? Yeah. 
It is absolutely Victor's justice. Um, uh, the, the victors themselves had something to do with the capitalist uh, systems of the, the victorious powers uh, more than anything. We made you know, a lot of tanks. Uh, uh, more, uh, the Soviets made a lot of tanks, right? More than um, uh, a sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, these, the convincing power of the norms themselves. 